Welcome to the National Soccer Coaches Association of America Winter Webinar Series. My name is David Newbury and I'm the coordinator of the NSCAA's Club Standards Project, an initiative designed to raise the performance of coaches and players one club at a time. Since May 2012, we've had over 750 clubs join, representing approximately 540,000 players and 48,000 coaches. The NCAA is delighted to have David Clark present today's webinar, which is the 10 ways to play like Barcelona. David's background is in sports journalism, and he's worked on the sports desk of the Sunday People and the Sunday Mirror, analyzing soccer games throughout the English leagues. Importantly, David has been coaching at grassroots roots level for over 15 years, and for the past five years has been the editor of Better Soccer Coaching. David is also the head coach of a youth coaching publication called Soccer Coach Weekly, which is a subscription service offered by Green Star Media featuring activities and articles by top coaches. Each month, David visits youth academies in the English Premier League to pick up the latest youth coaching ideas and to put them into a format to be used by even the most inexperienced grassroots coaches. Welcome, David, and not to put any added pressure on you today, but today does represent the highest attended webinar we've had with over 250 participants on. So welcome, David, to the presentation. Hi there, and thanks very much. Um, it's um, really good to be back with you, Dave, and uh, to be working with the NSCAA. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to take part in another webinar, and thanks to um, everyone who's tuned in. Uh, hopefully, um, you'll have something to take away with you today. Um, these are the two main things that I work on in youth coaching. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a coach as well, but these are where I get my main ideas through out to coaches out there. Uh, Soccer Coach Weekly on the left, that has just uh, had a revamp. Uh, it's now 12 pages of sessions and advice and uh, tips, and it, it, it's for coaches you know, from grassroots throughout you know, through to academy level. It's got some very good sessions in. We try and get influential players in world game and um, explain what they do in, in, and then uh, create sessions and drills around them that help you coach your teams and your players to develop in that manner. Um, I'd just like to start, first of all, um, with a little tale from, uh, I, I was at, Chris, at Christmas during the uh, period I wasn't doing any coaching, it was snow outside, um, and I was sort of playing Connect Four with my wife, which is a game of, you know, like uh, noughts and crosses, but it, it, it's quite, quite uh, you know, with counters and things. Anyway, after, after a close contest over a number of games, we were drawing, so, so the result rested on our final game. As the game was coming to an end, however, I realized that, um, I realized I was going to lose I could see all the, the play in front of me, and I counted the number of counters and where they would all go, and I realized I was going to lose. So um, I stood up, and um, I just walked off and said, you win. Just a minute, my wife called me back and said, what do you think you're doing? She said to me, you've taken away the glory of winning. You'd have something to say if we were on a soccer pitch. So we should all recognize the glory of winning. You know, when we lose, we should allow, you know, allow the victor the spoils. Because we can find our own glories we can take from defeat. There's always something to take away, even if it's just a topic to work on in training. The glory of winning, I thought, was an apt phrase when discussing Barcelona. Because Barcelona, even though they revel in winning, and they, their glory is that, they have nothing to do with the win-at-all-costs attitude. Their glory comes from the attitude that they have towards their players. You know, I look at it as the better an individual plays, the more they enjoy it, the more the individual enjoys it. And if they succeed in playing well or scoring a great goal, or they make a great save, they'll achieve, um, they'll achieve happiness and they'll achieve that, that glory. And basically that's the main aim of my talk today. Because um, Barcelona have such a high percentage of possession in games, uh, I, I won't actually be covering their pressing defending style that they, when they win the ball back. I mean, that's really... Uh, for another session, this is basically their attacking, uh, you know, where, where they have the ball for 70% or 80% of the time. Although, um, <laughs> I will mention that 
when Barcelona lost to Celtic in the Champions League. Um, that was despite having 85% possession of the ball. So, you know, even Barcelona lose when they should have won. I mean, that's the random factor in uh, our sport that makes soccer so much fun. If you have any questions, like Dave said, you, know, you can tap them in as, as we go along. Um, and uh, then they'll, Dave will have hold of them, and at the end we can um, go through a few of them. Right. Okay. Uh, play what you see. That's what I'm going to start here with. Um, it's a phrase I often use when talking uh, about passages of play, and one I use to talk to my players. I, I like them to play what they see in front of them. So although I'm coaching them how to beat a player, one-on-ones, how to do ever, they are the ones that see the game. They are the ones that my eyes see through them. You know, I'm standing on the touchline. They see what they have to do. Um, also important because um, I'm going to talk about playing out from the back through the thirds and finishing in the final, final third. Um, and this creates a lot of decisions for them. So they play what they see. However, this season, you know, I've just come through a period where that picture in front of you, I mean, that, that's what the pitches are like. So, um, I, I, you know, I came away from a, a talk and one of, the, one of the guys stood up and said, I'd just like all the dads out there who are coaches, one thing, please, play out from the back. Um, well, you know, we'd love to, but I, I turned up the very next day on, on, a, on a pitch that was practically waterlogged and the referee said, no, you know, I, he, the, the game will go ahead. And if we'd played out from the back, the ball would just got stuck continually um, in the water and, 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 you know, that we wouldn't have had a game. So we had to bypass parts of the pitch that were, so, so play what you see is applicable to the players and also applicable to what you're playing on. Um, and, and, and play what you see, it's something that, um, I, I, I was invited to coach another team earlier this year. And they, they, they asked me along to, um, to come, come and watch a friendly match that they were playing in. Um, they were playing against the local rivals and, and every time one of the players had the ball, the coaches were just screaming, pass here, pass there, what are you doing? Pa and then, uh, they, you know, no um, doubt about it, they went 3-0 down and um, one of the coaches turned to me and shouted to me, why don't you give them some advice? You're supposed to be this great coach, why don't you give them some advice? And I said to them, well, I want to watch what decisions do they make. I'm here watching your team. I it's no good me telling them what to do. I want them to do it. That, you know, telling them what to do is for the training ground. Anyway, at half time, like, you know, the manager was giving, telling them to do this, that, and the other. And they went out, and you know, all they needed was someone just to say, well, use the space at the back or try and pass the ball better. They don't need it during a, a game for that sort of thing. So play what you see is play what the players see. Um, uh, you know, any, any form of attacking soccer, wh however you play it, uh, works on the attacking principles of play. Um, Barcelona are no different. I mean, these are the attacking principles of play, and you, you should really know them because you, you should cover them, really. Um, any coaching syllabus should work on these attacking principles. Um, so with the idea that these are the attacking principles of play, and this is how we get through um, the game and how we create an attack. Let's look at um, Barcelona. Well, two huge personalities stand out for me with Barcelona, and the first one um, is Pep Guardiola, who's had a huge influence on the way um, Barcelona play. I mean, I know. At the, I mean, I know he's no longer their manager. I know Tito Villa, Villanova and his deputy um, are in charge, but you know, Pep has left this legacy with Barcelona and. Um, I can put it like this, it's basically, he says, cherish the ball as if you were a jealous lover. If you lose it, the team fights to get it back like a pack of dogs. By monopolizing the ball, you will minimize the random factor that we were talking about with Celtic beating his team. Um, and also, most importantly, you enjoy yourself. This is one of his ideas, you know, just like when you're in the school playground, all the fun is having the ball. You know, I'm sure someone like Jose Mourinho would... Um, Say so say different because he can play without the ball and still win games, but um, the misery to Pep lies in not having the ball. He wants the other team to feel that misery. 
And the second personality, of course, Lionel Messi. Um, Messi, well, he's just an extraordinary player. Um, he seems to, you know, have the ability to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But uh, what I'm, I'm going to say now is that I think we can teach our young players, if we teach them all the things that Messi does, then we're going to give, they're going to develop massively. So between the ages of 7 and 15, the best time for them to learn the Lionel Messi skills. Of course, you know, he, he does it naturally, but then he has been practicing every day. You know, he talks about going out and he does it and he, he learns how to do feints, how to do all these different skills. Um, and, 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 you know, his genius is knowing not only how to do it, but when and where. And that is the experience that um, our young players have to get. We can teach them the skills, but then they have to learn the when and where. And that comes from, um, uh, you know, allowing them to make mistakes. Um, his genius comes from experience, game craft within sessions that we create, and also when they're encouraged not to fear failure. Gamecraft replicates the demands of the game in a coaching session, and that's what I'm going to try and bring out today. Um, it encourages problem solving and decision making, and it creates challenges for the players. Repetition is key to this. Um, repetition, an atmosphere where failure and mistakes are not punished, that's what we want. If I quick, I'll quickly just um, go through what I think Lionel Messi does, basically, and that is he's been spending time with the ball on a daily basis just you know, weaving in and out of cones or imaginary defenders, which is basically homework for your players. He touches the ball with every step when he dribbles. We can coach that, even if we do it really slowly at first. He, goes, he runs slowly at a defender, then he'll draw them in, first pass them with speed. We can coach that. Play one and two touch soccer when it's on. Shield the ball. Don't give up. He never gives up. Lose the ball, he wins it back. He must be a nightmare to play against. So he sets players up and he sets the play up. He can play one touch, he can dribble, but he's learned all this. So I'm going to take you now on to some game craft ways to coach these skills. Um, if you have any questions about that, the bits that we've just gone through, you know, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't think that I, we can create young Lionel Messi's, which um, uh, <laughs> could well be a good point, uh, anything you'd want to questions on, please just send them in now. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit here about El Rondo warm-ups that you always see Barcelona do whenever they start a training session. And I saw them for the first time in England at one of the Premier League academies I visit. I, I really like going to work with academy players because it's so different from grassroots coaching. You know, they all turned up, all on time. Uh, they came up and shook hands with the coach. They came up and shook my hand. You know, and then, w without even asking, they split themselves into groups, uh, got some cones out of the bag and a ball, and set up these simple rondo warm-ups. You know, what I like about that is that those academy players, it gives them an ownership of the session. They already feel part of the session because they're setting themselves up. So I try to do this with my teams. When they get to training or when they get to matches, uh, get, get out just four cones. Um, El Rondo, it's, you know, it's about 10 yard by 10 yard, set it up, 3v1, 5v2s, and um, you know, they're, not, they're, they're not doing it at full match pace. They're just doing it, they're trying to block, they're trying to you know, win the ball, and they're having, you know, they're having fun, they turn up. Um, the player in the middle has the job of getting the ball off the others, and when he intercepts it, you know, they switch. Um, what, what's great is that it, I use it, it's a, a great social time for the players to get rid of that bit where they all want to talk to each other. They turn up, they want to talk about what they've done at school or what they've done at the last match or what they've seen on telly. And um, so it, it's a social event that gets them moving, passing, pressing, and, so, and they're communicating. So it's simple stuff. And, and, and you know, they go out on the pitch and they've been doing all this stuff and, and, and they're all ready, they're talking, they're ready. Um, and you can you can make it whatever you want. You can make it fast paced. You can get them to do one touches, two touches. Um, it's such a simple game, but it um, it's it, it is the start of the hours of repetition that um, Messi talks about that he puts in um, that he put in during his younger playing days. Um, 
there's lots of little exercises that you can pick up. Some are unopposed, some are opposed, um, but that, that I think um, El Rondo is really, really good and simple, and um, you know we can all set that up and get our players to give them a bit of ownership of the session before they even start. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the main, um, my main themes of possession, patience, and penetration. Um, this will start with playing out from the playing out from the back is quite um, a funny f phrase because um, I, I turned up at a session at a, at a match and um, the coach came up to me from the opposition team and said, you know, oh hi Dave, you know, I know you're always going on about playing out from the back, and he said, oh, you'll be very impressed with my team. He said, you always play out from the back. So I said, great, you know. Anyway, I, I, I stayed game went on, they did play out from the back, but the goalie basically played it to the wing-backs, either of the wing-backs, who immediately thumped the ball up the pitch. So immediately they were giving the ball back to us. Not only that, but they did it the same way every time. So my players just basically didn't bother about the middle of the pitch. As soon as they saw a goal kick, they went and pressed and won the ball. He wasn't very happy about this. He said to me, well, you'll you know, you tell, me, tell everyone to play out from the back, but you know, your players aren't allowing that to happen. And I said to him, well, you know, play out from the back isn't just playing it, throwing it to your wing backs. There's a whole central area just in front of the penalty area where I haven't got any players in there, and neither had you. you. You know, you've got to use the areas and not just boot the ball away. Use the areas and players have to fill in. As soon as they see space, you know, they fill in. And um, that's what the possession, um, I think, is all about. So this little game... Um, 6v6, which has goal minders as part of that. You have three defenders and two attackers in each half. So you've got um, your, three, your three defenders and two attackers. So your, your goal miners playing into your three defenders. These, this is part of playing out from the back. Um, the three defenders at the back have to make three passes. So they need to make three passes. And when they have achieved those three passes, then they are released. So that team are released, giving them three players to move into the opposition half to make a 5v3. The team without the ball, they're not allowed, they have to stay in their two areas. Now I'm sure you can see how that little movement in there, keeping the ball and then the race through, giving a 5 by 3 And there's loads of attacking options here. Um, you know, the overload in attack, there's three goals, there's a goal minder, and then you're getting the play out from the back and straight away onto the attack. Um, I, I, I wasn't going to include this, but two or three people said to me oh, well, that they, I, I put this session on the other day, and two or three people said to me they really, really liked it, and they found it was a good, um, a good session to get the players passing and uh, then, then moving quickly. Right. Okay, so... This, um, I'm also going to show this, uh, this is playing out from the back, but this is continually playing through the thirds. So this is all about support play and movement to create overloads everywhere on the pitch. Um, each player, well, I'll start by, you've got a, a, the, the defending team has a goalie and four players, and the others have five players, which gives me the chance to bring one, one player each time into an overlap situation. So you can see the 2v1s and the 2v2s in front of you. Um, as the overloads take over, you've got defense winning the ball, playing it through with a 2v1, and then we've got a 3v2 in midfield. This This creates some great situations to play through and then you're moving into take that overload into the final phase. I, 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 that's a really nice little setup game that um, helps players understand playing through the thirds because it's got the three parts of that you know you can say this is defense, this is midfield, and this is attack and um, when you've done it a couple of times I quite like to then put a goal at the other end and play the game um, as a small sided game so you, you, you know you're playing through the thirds but you're keeping players more or less, um, like in a game situation, these are the, all your thirds that you're playing through. So, uh, if you've got any questions on the, any of those, or if you you know you want more information about those sessions, um, just um, tell Dave on 
the question part of the webinar control panel. Okay, so this takes us into patience. Um, patience is quite a tricky part. You know, the patience thing is where Barcelona are playing the ball and playing the ball, uh, recycling it, and you think nothing's happening, and then all of a sudden, Iniesta, bang, 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 Messi, and it, it, within seconds, and you've hardly noticed, they've gone, you know, and they've, they've, they've spotted, um, uh, they've spotted the, the, the space, they've spotted the chance, they've taken it, and they've moved through those thirds, and uh, hit like, you know, just, it's, it's so quick, isn't it, that um, um, sometimes you, <laughs> it's, it, it's difficult to see it. Um, I've got a very simple game. I haven't actually got it on thing because you don't really need it, but um, I use it as a scene setting game uh, for my possession based work, for my patience based work. Um, I just simply pick two teams, uh, 3v3 or 8v8, whatever number of players you have, and then play normal rules, but the number of passes and the build up to any goal is the number of goals they get. So if they make five passes and score, they've got six goals. You can count the goal as well. But if, say, they make ten passes and they shoot and miss, then it's no goals. Um, that's such an easy one to set up. And, and um, I set this game up, and um, I get the parents to help me. I do this little exercise. Um, I get a dad to look at each team, one for each team, and just to count, if we play, say we play, the game for 10 minutes. We just count the number of passes each team makes for the whole thing. So you've also you've got the goals and how many passes they score, but you've also got the number of passes the whole team actually makes. Um, and then I also get, I get helpers, as many as you can, and get them to concentrate on one player each and write down how many times that player had the ball and how many times he successfully passed it. Well, I know it's a bit, you know, it's a bit of a thing to set up with parents and everything, but it, it's only 10 minutes and you don't have to do it all the time, but if you, you, you make a note of it and try and cover all your players over, say, a period of three weeks, and o o over the period, playing these games and playing these little things, you'll notice how more, more often the players actually want the ball to pass it and how much more often they do. Um, one other thing, I, while, while I'm talking about this, I might as well just add that... Um, I also get a parent to, to um, add up the, the amount of time I spend with players not doing anything, so the amount of time I call them in and talk to them. Um, if, if it's an hour-long session and I'm talking for 15 minutes in an hour-long session, I'm probably giving them too much information and not enough playing. So that, that's another way to look at what you're doing, because you in, in a training session you want to get as much time playing as possible. Um, I certainly know a lot of academy coaches do this. Um, you know, they don't like um, to see coaches stopping the game continually and talking. Um, I, I watched a, um, a coach, <laughs> it was unfortunate for him really, I was there, but he had an interview and um, he, he had to coach a session in his interview. Uh, so it, was, it was a really good session, you know, I spoke to him about it and, um, and, 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 and it was good and he had some great ideas. but. He, did, he spent a lot of time talking, and, and, and after the session, um, the, the, the academy director spoke to, to the, the, you know, took the kids to one side. I think, I think they were under nines or under tens. Said, "What did you think about the session?" And they all said, "Boring. Spoke too much. We wanted to play. He kept stopping us." So um, that's just a little, you know, a little aside on what you can do to help. Um, this is. Um, a possession game which helps with the patience thing, the idea. It's just a simple 2v1 overloads. One of the grey players, um, you can't actually see, but he is, uh, one of the grey players is a neutral, so he plays whoever has the ball, so if the whites win it, then they have the three. Um, but you, you try and keep 2v1s um, overloads, so you're continually just passing and moving and passing and moving. Um, and, 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 and it's just a really simple game that you can set up, have two or three going at once depending on your number of players, and um, it really helps them to get the idea of passing around and using space. Right, so that's, um, that's that. Um, oh yeah, once I, I just, on this, obviously um, the size of the playing area is, is really important. I mean, it's obviously important in most sessions, but in this one, 
you know, if you make it a really tight area then, and the space is really hard to find, then you're giving them a really, you know, fast workout. But if they're, they're not as confident and they're not getting any success, well, just make the area big enough for them to get that success. And, um, you know, so if you say 20 by 20 yards to start with and then drop it down to 10 by 10 or, well, maybe a bit bigger, then, you know, you're, 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 you're basically you're, you're moving them on and making them think quicker and use their skills quicker. Uh, if, if you've got any questions about that session or any of the other sessions, once again, you can just send them in. So let me get on to our final bit, which is penetration. Um, one v ones in the final final third. Um, this is this is when you've you know you've got the ball to build at play, and suddenly you're going to burst through and score. Um, this is where one v ones are really important. Um, Lionel Messi, you know, like I've said, just outstanding at these sort of things. But if you actually look at what he does, he uses the feint quite a lot, where he goes slowly towards them, looks one way, and then he'll just ghost past and go the other. Um, so that, that's just the, that's just one one skill, you know. I, and, and children love learning skills. You know, I have mine quite often at the start of a session. I'll say to them, right, let's go, you know, between two of you. Um, Let's you know see how many different skills you can do, or let's see if you can actually do one or do two, depending on how developed they are. This game, I I quite like this game. It's it's great for um, uh, you know the kids love this because you've got four one v ones um, and and a game going on in the center. So it's three v three, and but to to score in the goal you. You've got to run with the ball into the box and beat a player in a 1v1. Um, so you're either running at a distance, which obvious is two different things. If you're tight on the player, like you are in this instance, you're going to probably use a feint and get past him. In this instance, you're going to have to teach something, maybe a step over, maybe something else, because there's a lot of time between the player getting the ball and reaching the 1v1 situation. You may well be very, very fast and be able to just burst past the player. But um, that's the decision making that I'm talking about earlier that we want our players to be able to um, to do. Um, so actually just before um, so what what I've come through in those um, in those three, four sessions is um, the fact that the, the, this bit here is ticking the creativity box from the five principles of attack. And I think if you think back, we've gone through them all now. We've done space, creating space, support play, movement, penetration, and finally, this little bit here, which is the creativity bit. So that takes me on to challenges. Um, it, this little boy, um, how do we help him achieve his dream of playing like Messi? It, it, in the detail of your coaching, one thing you must think about is the quality of the questions and challenges you set your players, when you ask them and how you ask them. I like to set challenges individually. Um, so, so, you know, a, a lot of the grassroots, you have players on so many different um, levels, you know, and, and if I was to set him a challenge, I could just set him something very simple like, um, can I play forward when the ball's passed to me? Um, that, that's a, you know, a great challenge. He's got the ball. Can he turn with it or can he move with it? But just can he play it forward? And that's all I'm thinking about in his 10-minute session. That's all he's thinking in his head. Can he play it forward? And then the next time, it might be something different. Can he beat a player in a 1v1? Can he try and, and run with the ball? Or can he lend it to someone else and get it back, you know, a 1-2? A um, try, try and give challenges that affect the individual and also, in a team challenge, it would be something like, can the players leave the ball playable for the next player? So can we not only pass it, but, but leave it in a situation where the player can run onto it or, or the player can run into space with it? So challenges are very important um, part of building your, um, your, your session plans and building the session and working through the session. As, as the challenges get harder, the players developing. And, so, and you know, so is the team. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, 
going back to creating an atmosphere at your club where you allow players to try skills and make decisions. Um, you need a way of managing mistakes. You can't, you know, have this idea that we want them to pass the ball and give them challenges because often they will make mistakes. Um, you know, you, you need to use things. I, I quite like self-correction because if the challenge is right and the learning outcome is clear over the course of two or three weeks, the players may well put the mistake right themselves. They may well look at a, look at a friend or look at another player and realize that what they're doing is wrong because they're, they're, you know, they're losing the ball every time. Um, so obviously sometimes that's, that, that, that wouldn't work with, and with certain players it won't, but um, sometimes I'll, there'll be activities where it's quite a, you know, quite a frantic activity and there's opportunities for me to take players to one side and talk to them individually which um, you know I like to do, but then you know players do talk, and they will say to them, "Oh, what 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 was Dave talking to you about there?" And so I need to mix it up, make sure that I'm not doing the same thing with the same players, um, because they they soon spot what you're doing. Another way is to ask them questions like, "What were you thinking when you tried that?" Give them a chance to explain what they saw and why they did it. Um, and then you can give them clues after that to help them out and when you do and, 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 um, and, and you know, you, you just put, putting in their mind at ease so that what they did wasn't wrong and also putting in their mind what was right or how they could make it right. Um, you also need to manage your own mistakes as well and not feel bad when a session goes wrong. Um, you know, I, I ran a session the other night and it just, you know, I came home and I thought, oh, it just didn't work. You know, the, I can't, like the players, I don't think the players enjoyed it, and I, even though I changed it and tried to make it happen, it, it just wasn't happening. Um, I, I remember I watched a, um, a defending session put on by a, well, I won't, I won't say who it was, but he was an international coach and a Premier League coach, a, you know, a fabulous coach, and um, we were working with some under-14 players, and he was showing how attacking, how you defend against an attacking th three players. Uh, you, got, you kept getting the players to the defenders to move, but there was one young player, and every time the defenders moved, he got past them and scored. And this went on for about four or five goals, and I could, you could see the coach, to, you know, top top class coach, just getting totally exasperated because he couldn't make the session work. And and you know, afterwards he explained how difficult it was to coach coaches as well as <laughs> run sessions. But um, you know, he knew. Oh, well, we all knew, you know, that the session just hadn't worked, and um, it happens to everyone, and it happens to the, you know, the best coaches. So you must mustn't be hard on yourself, and you must manage your own mistakes and and, and try and correct those. Okay, so um, finally, I just want to talk about um, the key elements of how how Barcelona would would play tactically, and how you could do it with the youth team. Um, I, I think we could probably say, uh, you know, make any statement, say four one two three one or whatever with Barcelona, and you couldn't quite see on the, whether they were actually playing that or not, because, um, I, I, you know, th they don't really need someone to say, well, here, here, here's how you set up. Um, they just, they just fill in gaps and spaces, and they're continually moving. But, I, but I do think as a youth team, to try and play four three three is an excellent way. Of playing out the back, playing through the the, the you know the, the thirds, and um, creating penetrate penetrative um, chances for you to for you to get your player through. Um, it's a system that's based on you know the players on the wings, the fullbacks and the wingers, the passing, the triangle in the centre of a pitch, which could be either a, a attacking or defensive. And now this is um, it's a good um, tactical system to to look into and um, to try and work your players around. So, if um, we go back to the three main points, um, I, I worked on um, this sort of um, session uh, planning for a while now, and I have a, one team who last season we we, play, we played in our final game of the season, and the two teams, the opposition and us, both both could finish second, and finishing second in that league meant you got a trophy. If you finished third, you didn't. So first and second got trophies, but we couldn't quite catch um, the, fur, the, team, the team at the top. Um, that, the, the team we were playing on, you needed a draw, and, it, and, and we played a lot. It was a very, very tight, tough game. Um, but the, 
with 10 minutes to go, we actually scored a goal that won it, and that goal came, the goalkeeper played it out, it went into midfield, and three, <laughs> the three players backheeled the ball into space, backheeled it, you know, it was great, that, I mean, you know, the pressure was really on them, and then they moved forward, the winger cut inside, slipped the ball through, and we scored a goal, and, um, you know, the whole season that we've been working on, all these kind of um, sessions and, and, and ideas and challenges, had, in that one instance, had basically come up trumps of them and the glory of winning was there for all to see. So uh, I, I'd have to say I didn't jump up and down on the touchline. I was quite uh, reserved, as you can imagine. But, you know, that was a fabulous goal.